So the first one is just kind of a general um, kind of tell me about it uh, question about Bride. I wanted to know about the initial moment that kind of sparked, you know, the conception of Bride or I guess the first idea, the first inspiration that happened because it is such a huge and like kind of jarring piece almost at first. So I'm just wondering what was that? Was the first, you know, conception of it as equally jarring? Oh, that's funny. Um, well, I, that, that is a, actually a really interesting question because, um, I mean, I cannot, <laughs> the honest answer is I actually cannot recall the immediate moment when I decided to make Bride. And I think that is in large part because uh, studio practice has this um, continuum that happens where um, things begin to rise to the surface as you're making other things. So it really has been, it was like a natural evolution, evolution to kind of get to Bride um, through this ongoing exploration of material culture and thinking about compositions of, of still lives and kind of the parallels of um, historic still life genre and contemporary um, culture, economic culture, medicinal culture, um, theological, you know, um, kind of organization. So for me, it was like this natural evolution. I was, trying, I was like, God, did I have this? I know I had a moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I clearly had a moment that I thought, oh, I should make it, you know, a 10 foot tall sculpture that is um, that is uh, kind of addressing uh, a level of order and then disorder, you know, um, entropy, you know, mm -hmm. order to entropy. Um, but I, I think, I think that it's such a great question because it really alludes to the way that, that um, different people work within studio practice and what feeds their studio practice. For me, very, you know, mo all the work that I do um, has seeds in um, um, research of, of some kind or another, whether it's books or objects or podcasts. So, um, and sometimes it's really unexpected stimulus, you know, like, going to the supermarket and seeing two pieces of fruit that have rotted together and, and hold together. And then just thinking about that. Um, but I, I, I was really obsessed at the time with um, these somewhat decorative objects called aperns. Okay. And, and then I was thinking about um, like domesticated objects for holding and presenting things and centerpieces. And I know that that came into the equation when I started to think about making something monumental. And then I was also simultaneously starting to, to really explore the idea of creating compositions that were portraits of individuals. Um, and not necessarily specific individuals, but like the idea of a bride, for instance, or the idea of um, even a self-portrait, you know, which would be very specific. And I was, I was working at the time on other works that, that started to bring that conversation more directly into the work. It wasn't, it wasn't just about status symbols or um, parallels between um, the Dutch economy in the 1600s and contemporary capitalism. It started to become more almost like a holistic portrait of, of a human. Um, so I, I unfortunately cannot share with you the shining 
crystal clear moment. <laughs> well, it's it's the bride. Is almost better. I like the idea of this, you know, sort of a stream of consciousness, you know, d dipping into other, other, you know, areas of research and kind of coming up with a certain, like you said, holistic study almost of, a, of an idea or a multitude of ideas. And it kind of goes into um, one of my other questions, which was when I looked at your work, I noticed you have um, a piece called Portrait of a Man. Um, and I found that that was really an interesting piece because I haven't previously thought of glasswork as being a holistic portrait, like you said. But once I started to think of it in that way, um, it kind of made a ton of sense. And so I wanted to know um, if Bride was a portrait, and you touched on that a bit. And if so, has your view of the port, like the, the whole nature of the portrait changed given the current times? Like, is the almost, I guess, understanding or you know breakdown of the portrait the same you know after you know a certain amount of time and in the current circumstances almost um well i do feel that the work takes on different contexts depending upon what goes on around us at any given time and i i believe that that's what can create a timeless work of art is if you can continue to find ways of unpacking the information in a way that that feels relevant for, for now. Um, I certainly, I personally think about how systems fail and how uh, the body politic fails um, when I think about bride now right um, and the the chasm between the ideal um and the reality of of which was really the main impetus for the work i would say I was also looking at um in depth uh duchamp's bride stripped bare by our bachelors even and um just looking at a lot of parallels with the way that he um creates narrative and then foils narrative in his work. Um, so, so certainly, you know, the impetus has changed over time, you know, from the moment that I made the work until now. And I, I, um, that's just for me though. So I, it's really up to the audience as to whether or not there's relevance, but I certainly think about kind of the order and um, structure found at the at the top of the sculpture, um, and then the the kind of gradual disintegration and aftermath at the bottom of the structure. For me, that like that still holds a lot of um, information about one way of thinking uh, about the time that we're we're living in now, and and. Um, but those, you know, those are, those are structures, obviously, that will, that exist, that those are natural structures. Exactly. So, right. so yeah, so I think about these, these, like, almost water drops in a pond, like, if you start to think about, or layers of an onion, how, how these natural structures apply mm -hmm. um, to, to our contemporary dilemma of being human. For sure, I definitely think it is it is applicable and always um, on par, basically, with how the contemporary dilemmas that we're always dealing with are shaping and morphing. I always find myself in the museum looking at it and kind of noticing something new and understanding sort of a new piece of it and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, very awesome. So, um, next question. Uh, it's positioned in uh, next to Fran Snyder's Market Scene on a Quay at the NCMA. And I wanted to know, um, I wanted to hear a little bit about your initial kind of inspiration from uh, Snyder's piece, because I read that parts of the, the large um, portrait, I guess, are you made out of glass as well and put them inside of Bride. Um, so I just wanted to hear a little bit about the relationship between the two pieces from your end. Okay. Well, the work um, Bride was, retrofitted actually when it came to the North Carolina Museum of Art so that it could have 
very specific references to other permanent collection works. Um, and I, I really enjoy the opportunity to do things like that when I, when I'm given the opportunity. I think that um, it continues to create like a living dialogue with um, the location and the time that it's being shown. So I, of course, gravitated to Snyder because that work is just incredibly magnificent. Um, and I'm really just generally fascinated with the market scenes and, and almost the folly of the market scenes. I mean, they were, in a sense, a certain level of propaganda at the time that they were painted from showing the wealth of the, of the economy at that time, the culture at that time. And, and, and also there's different ways of interpreting some of the, the bounty, you know, not everything was necessarily eaten that was killed. Um, so a lot of it became trophy. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot to that particular Snyder composition and to that genre um, that I find really fascinating. Um, ironically, also, like when I, when I started to create some of the compositional components, not just the Snyder's um, cat and bird, but the, um, the plate of fish and the candlesticks from Strauzzi's um, St. Lawrence distributing the treasures of the church. I have my notes here because I was like, oh, I can remember. <laughs> Um, but I, I had also hurt my my body like around the time that I was fabricating um, for that piece to retrofit it. And so I really had this moment where I couldn't, I, I struggled. I struggled with um, the material and that that kind of challenge went back into the piece. So this, and I, I just do want to point out that all of these moments are expressions of capturing a moment in time, whether it is like a struggle or, uh, or you flow within the material. So, so all of those moments, it's almost like a journaling process, right? right. Um, but the, the, there's also the Esther scroll. And so there's, there's different ways that, um, you know, a composition like this can certainly, certainly like reflect what is around it and be in dialogue with what is around it. It can also absorb it and consume it. Right. And um, yeah, almost like a, a black hole, right? Everything starts to gravitate into. <laughs> so I think, I think that that's, I think that that is, um, that also maybe can speak to the way audiences come to a museum and have an experience. What are they consuming? What are they taking and absorbing and, and, and walking away with? And how does that impact their daily life or, or not in the future? How, how, does, how do all of these observations change us on a minute level or on a, uh, a magnificent level moving forward over time. Exactly. Um, so that was just that moment, you know, where I came observed and was deeply impacted by certain things in, in that collection. And I, you know, I'm anxious to return at some point and, and see <laughs> what strikes me next. Right. Right. Um, we can't wait to have you. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I noticed looking through your work as well that there is um, a work called uh, lay. Correct me if I'm pronouncing this incorrectly, but laid timetable with cicads. Cicads, yeah. Cicads, mm -hmm. awesome. Um, mm -hmm. And I was really interested in that piece and how it deals with time in the Anthropocene and um, kind of these large questions of. Um, like materiality and eternality and, and that type of thing. And I wanted to know if it had any relationship to the thought process that went into Bride, because personally, when I see Bride, I see kind of a cycle almost of building and unbuilding and entropy and perfection and this kind of thing. And it's kind of, it kind of reminded me of, of this other piece. And I wanted to know if there was any relationship there. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it has a relationship in that um, late timetable with psych had happened, you know, five years after Bride. So it's a, it's an, a, a later piece. Um, and not that not that all work is linear in this way. It's also cyclical to your point, but um, Bride definitely kind of deeply shaped what came after it. Um, but I think the the I pivot I pivoted a little bit. I did a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship um, at the Natural History Museum um, in DC. Awesome. And I started researching because I had been reading probably since 2011. So really right around the time after Bride was, um, was finished, I had been, I had started reading about climate change and um, becoming increasingly more and more worried and concerned and, 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 um, and not witnessing any kind of like recognition by the greater community around me at that time it was still really only talked about by scientists or like there was a few articles here and there right and um so i proposed researching other times of global warming um in the earth cycle to to research at the the history museum and that led me down the path of of finding a visual language mm -hmm. that could um, communicate about deep time and um, begin to um, really illustrate some of the things that I was concerned with in thinking about the beginning and the end of the Anthropocene and 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 what that what that looks like. Of course, now. 2020 here we are and uh i think it's 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 really become front and center especially in the last four to five years right um so but but those those um <clears throat> illustrations and pro the process of depicting growth and decay um remains that's a strong thread through the bride, and it continues to be a strong thread into my studio practice today. Um, this um, creation through destruction as well. Right. Interesting. Well, that also leads into another question. Do you have any future works that are coming up that you care to chat about, or is it all under wraps? <laughs> oh, it's under wraps. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still working, <laughs> thankfully. Right. Um, I just finished. Uh, a new body of work that will be on view at Nora Jaime Gallery in the fall in New York City. And I also have um, a, a solo exhibition at the Museum of Art and Design in the fall, open September 24th. And I did just finish a brand new work in, um, called House Album for that particular, ex it wasn't specifically for that exhibition, but it will be featured. And, and once again, here we are, you know, this is, my life's work, I believe, is this particular piece, House Album, is um, a selected portrait of the United States through objects. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of combined the tradition of Victorian scrapbooking with a period room um, understanding and mashed them together Very with, uh, yeah, yeah. So it should be, it should be a good, exhibition I think so that'll be it's not really a mid-career survey it's more of a decade of selected work um, at MAD and then the the show at Nora's will continue this exploration of deep time and also um, a, a layering of biomorphic and like allusion to human the body with uh, with um, the natural world. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of um, kind of plant focused material combined with cultural objects right. in, in that particular show. It's called Every Last Thing. So, and then one other piece I'm working on in earnest is for Crystal Bridges um, Museum of American Art. And it's, it is another portrait of um, 
a particular person and her family, um, Abigail Levy Franks, who was um, alive in the 1700s in New York City. So I'm, and they hold the, Crystal Bridges holds the, their portraits, Abigail's portrait and her family's portrait. So I'm creating a, um, a shipping trunk that will be um, illuminated with objects inside that will be referring to that particular story. Amazing. It sounds like you have so much going on and it's all incredible work, I'm sure. I can't wait to see a lot of it. Um, I have one last question because this is kind of a silly question, but I just think about it every time I see Bride. And since that's what we're talking about, I thought I'd ask it. Um, any of the objects, did they start out on the top and then you like dropped them or something and then they ended up on the bottom? Yeah, or are all yeah. the objects completely where they should be? Because I feel like I would totally just drop one and just say, hey, okay, yeah. on the bottom it goes. Yeah. Well, I mean, the answer to that question would be yes, <laughs> because um, it's actually quite hard to um, compose something that it looks spontaneous. Right. Um, and I, I mean, it, there, <laughs> you almost have to fool yourself. So one of the ways that I work in my studio is I literally will destroy things. Or I literally will, um, I will literally drop things from, from a space to the floor and create an action that um, becomes the action. <laughs> it becomes the composition. Mm -hmm. Because I find that that kind of directness and, uh, has an authenticity that translates to the viewer. For sure. Um, so instead of illustrating an action, I act. And then it is, it is the moment. That being said, there is interpretation every time um, the museum now um, installs the bride. There, there is room for interpretation. Um, not tremendous room, but it it will be slightly different every time, and that is interesting as well. I think about Solowit a lot as well as some other artists that work in that way. So so that it is a constantly living and changing work. Right, just like the world around it. Exactly. That's yeah. awesome. Well, thank you so much. That's all I have for you. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. This has been an amazing interview. Um, I'm so glad that uh, you, were, you were here for it and that I was here for it and I hope that we can get back to normal very soon and uh, you can make it down to NCMA and see all those other works maybe. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. This has been really fun and um, hope everyone continues to stay safe and make the best of the time that we're going through at this time. So. Right, well you as well. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.